Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. Wanted to resume the series of videos on Edmund Husserl's. Obviously, this is one of the greatest works of philosophy, but also one of the most challenging. It's not a challenging work because of some, you know, intentional obfuscation at the level of style or at the level of language, which you might find with a thinker like Deleuze or a thinker like Judith Butler, um, making the argument more inaccessible than it needs to be. The irony about Husserl is he's far more difficult to read than Judith Butler or Deleuze, precisely because he doesn't feel the need to make his arguments more um, seem more complicated than they really are. He is actually going out of his way to make them as accessible as possible because like Sigmund Freud, he really was, in a certain sense, considering a scientist who maybe provide answers to serious problems, even to the extent of making phenomenology into something like a universal science. And as a universal science, uh, phenomenology had to have something of a unique stance with regard to all of the other sciences. And the problem of methodology will come to consume the preliminary considerations of method chapter, which opens the procedure of pure phenomenology in respects of methods and problems section of the book. Now, this is a work which is um, uniquely dense and challenging, which is impossible to try to talk about the whole book um, at any serious level within just one video. It's probably going to be more like a series of five or maybe even six videos. But this video I just want to focus on, this is the first chapter of the um, section of the book, The Preliminary Considerations of Method, which will show that Husserl's claim that phenomenology is something of a universal science or at the very least that it has a unique position relative to all the other sciences, will force him to explicate how the methodology which the other sciences use are um, simply incompatible with the kind of things he's gonna do. And they would actually be not only useless, but maybe even harmful for arriving at the kind of conclusions which phenomenology is uniquely suited to answer. Um, so the unique methodology which phenomenology has is something which is rarely acknowledged as first and foremost, really a viable alternative to analytic philosophy. Obviously with phenomenology, you have these sort of later movements in which the emphasis becomes more and more over time on things which are not exactly the ambition of having a universal science. Not exactly the phenomenology, the emphasis um, kind of uh, the emphasis largely shifts uh, with Heidegger to things like um, you know death and um, you know something like the problems of a leap of faith which Kierkegaard was interested in too and with Gadamer you have this emphasis on phenomenology as a type of access to hermeneutics showing how the interpretation of classical Greek and Latin texts um, requires a, once again, methodology different from the natural sciences. Um, and then of course with you know Sartre and existentialism and with Merleau-Ponty and the body, you have this morphing of phenomenology into something which deals with a lot of concerns which are not necessarily the emphasis in a work like The Ideas. And the early Husserl, as a mathematician who was trying to provide an answer to the same problem of what is a number that you see in um, Frege and Russell, was trying to answer the question in a completely different way than they did. In a sense that phenomenology differs from Frege or Russell in that you cannot subordinate a philosophy problem solving um, task to some established formal discipline in mathematics. The way that Frege tried to answer the question of what is a concept, which is a very old philosophical problem, going all the way back to uh, Plato and Aristotle and to he uh, Hegel and Kant and all of these great thinkers were asking, well, what is really a concept or universal anyway? And Frege answered that question by the, the concept, pun intended, of a function can provide the kind of clarity which you would miss just from, you know, using Hegel's methodology and the phenomenology of spirit in the perception section dealing with, you know, universals and such. And the way that he did this was by showing that in mathematics, so in philosophy, concept is not clear at all. 
But in mathematics, function is absolutely clear. It's simply a way, like this is how we teach middle school, you know, math students of kind of like a machine where you take an input and you get an output. Okay, so if you have an input here, like three, and the function is f of x equals x squared, you can get an output like nine. If you change the input to five, you can get a, an output like 25. You see how this works. And Frege thought, similarly, you can treat concepts not as these mysterious universals, but rather as functions that relate an object to a truth value. So rather than just relate numbers to numbers, as we normally would thought of functions, a function can relate an object to a truth value on the basis of whether or not that object has that specific property is a kind of informal way to put it. So for example, if you have a concept like redness um, and you have an object like I do right here of this copy of Animal Farm by George Orwell, which does have a red cover, I could say that this book um, as, an, as an input to the function of red yields true because that's a true statement. A book that's not red, like, um, George Orwell's 1984. This is a white book. If I submit this to the concept of red, I'll get an output with a different truth value, which is false. And you can pretty cleanly um, go through the set of objects in existence, and they'll all pretty much either evaluate to true or false. And therefore, Frege showed that what was unclear just at the level of philosophy can become much more clear if you turn to some established formal discipline of mathematics to provide the uh, extra certainty that you didn't have by not using it. However, for Husserl, such an approach would be completely unsatisfactory because the suspension of the natural attitude, as I talked about in my first video on this book, makes it impossible to gain greater certainty or more secure methodological grounding from borrowing established certainties from some foreign discipline. So with phenomenology, the natural attitude is this attitude you have towards um, the world. That natural, okay, just making sure this is streaming. And I know that's annoying, but believe me, there have been issues with that as recently as my video on the greatest philosopher, philosophy book. So anyway, um, the natural attitude is this very, very briefly um, attitude that you are a thinker who's in maybe a human body situated in a world populated with things, and you interpret them as obeying the metaphysics of worldly objectivity. And you're sort of located in this world that's spread out in space and time um, all around you, and you, you know, maybe can do other scientific disciplines with that attitude. That is the attitude you have if you're doing biology or botany or one of those type of sciences. Geology is another one. Uh, but with phenomenology, you have to have a different methodology. And by suspending the natural attitude, you are given better access to what's already within consciousness. And the kind of certainty you get from that is simply superior to the uh, security or certainty you'll get from borrowing a concept from some mathematical discipline. But of course, there's other limitations of axiomatic methodology. So the big thing for this chapter, I'll just say right now, is his methodology is neither this type of you know simple descriptivist uh, methodology of the natural sciences. So the way that biology proceeds is you observe stuff and you describe it, okay? and you just build up fact after fact after fact with that descriptivist methodology. With uh, mathematical uh, type of formal disciplines, at least at his time, you were largely working with axiomatic methodology. And axiomatic methodology is something you might take for granted in the Western tradition, but it really was kind of a unique historical perspective that you get from ancient Greece. And since that axiomatization, the story usually goes, was the result of ancient Greek Hellenization of Egyptian geometry. And the idea that the Egyptians had this sort of geometry of ways of understanding how you measure the earth in the sense that for the ancient Egyptians, geometry was quite literally measuring the earth. If you have like Gaia as mother earth and uh, metrics as a type of measurement, geometry for the ancient Egyptians was literally uh, measuring the earth. And it wasn't just measuring like this abstract 
ideal space of Euclidean geometry. It was more like measuring a very specific piece of land, which was the agricultural fields of the Nile Delta. And the understanding of geometry for the ancient Egyptians was largely that it was about an objective piece of land. And it was about conclusions from a past growing season. And when the ancient Greeks take this, they transform it from statements about an objective land in Egypt to the breathless, widthless, depthless points, which Euclid op opens the, uh, the elements by defining points as. Basically for um, Euclid, a point is something with no um, width, no depth, okay? It's the type of banishing of distances, which you do see in Oswald Spangler's analysis of the difference between Egyptian and ancient Greek worldviews. And certainly the idea for the ancient Egyptians of preserving specific likenesses of pharaohs in the past and preserving specific bodies of pharaohs in the past through mummification would lead them to understand geometry as this type of preservation, no doubt, of um, knowledge, but it was not abstract, ideal knowledge, uh, which Euclidean geometry is. It was rather about a specific piece of land at a specific season that is carried over. And the uh, difference between the mummy and the goddess statue of Aphrodite or Artemis, um, which I will do a video on uh, Oswald Spengler um, sometime and now analyzing those, is the difference between you know, a mummy for the ancient Egyptians is a preservation of the past. It's just a preservation of it as a mummified relic of something we lived, but now it's dead. And, you know, that's exactly what the pharaoh's body is when it becomes a mummy. But for the ancient Greeks, you have something like a preservation. It's just not a preservation of something dead and not a preservation of something with a determinate location in the past. The uh, statue of if you've seen the um, Afro de Milo, the Venus de Milo, the famous um, statue of Venus without arms, um, you'll, you will get the sense that you're looking at somebody who is from the past and is now dead. You get the sense that you're, from, you're looking at someone who has maybe even more presence um, than the people viewing her, because although you have an understanding that her you know, span of dwelling on the earth and participating in mythological events spans well before your lifetime even began. You're overwhelmed by the youth and just the utter beauty of these statues of the Greek gods and goddesses, um, which is the Greek methodology, um, the Greek worldview rather than the Egyptian worldview. And what happens with this adoption of um, Egyptian engineering formulas basically for land measurement, um, becoming ancient Greek ideality and eternal presence, is that you have axiomatization as a natural outcome of that. Because for Aristotle, axiomatization, both circular reasoning and infinite regress, by providing, I guess, truths which don't need to be proved. So if you didn't have axioms, which are truths that don't need to be proved because they're obvious. Like, um, if equals be added unto equals, um, then the results will be equal, or um, sort of uh, foundational um, uh, thoughts in Euclid's, um, like um, all right angles are equal. Uh, if you didn't have that, you would either have circular reasoning in which the conclusion and the premise are the same. You reach the conclusion because you snuck one, one of the premises of your argument is the conclusion. That's circular reasoning. Infinite regress is the idea that in order to gain certainty, you have to prove um, one statement and move back and have to prove another and another and another and another, and you never actually stop. And axioms allow you to avoid both. And uh, geometry was you know, the traditional axiomatic science. Um, arithmetic was largely a science where they got more and more and more true results. And yet, by the time of Peano, uh, the arithmetic stood in need of axiomatization because um, you were starting to derive contradictory results from a lack of axioms to work from. And Peano tried to uh, do the this by the same type of 
you know, definitions and axioms that you had in Euclid. So in Euclid, for example, a definition is something like a point. A point is that which has no part, he says in the Greek. Because a point is not like an object. It's more like the negation of objectivity. It's more like breathless, widthless, depthless location, I guess you could say. And um, Peano tried to axiomatize arithmetic by providing definitions like successor, number, and zero. And with these definitions, you can, in, you can ideally, anyway, generate the whole series of counting from zero. of zero right there, we have a number and a successor to show us that, um, you know, a number, if it's a number like zero, it'll have a successor and no two successors will be the same. So one is the successor of zero, two is the successor of one. It's not that one and two are both the successor of zero. This is how you have the unique, um, the uniqueness of each number that allows you to get something like, you know, uh, movement from zero to a thousand or something like that. But Bertrand Russell showed that there's problems with this methodology because it's not as um, foundational as Peano thought. What if successor, which remember is undefined, is instead implicitly understood to be the operation of cutting in half? And what if zero is, which is not defined, is implicitly understood to actually be the number that we would normally call one? What you would get is a similar series of numbers which obey the rules that he laid down. There's no contradiction of that. But you get a very different series of numbers. You start with one, and if we define successor as that which is half, well, then you get the next number as one half. Um, but keep in mind, this number one is supposed to be zero, and this number one half is supposed to be one. And then the next number is one fourth and then one eighth, and then one sixteenth, and then one thirty second. And obviously you're still generating a, no a series of numbers. It is just not the series of numbers from zero to a thousand that you were trying to get with Peano. So obviously there are deep problems with axiomatization and even Russell's very lengthy response to this problem in Principia Mathematica eventually found um, problems with um, uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorems showing that no formal system sufficiently powerful to uh, you know generate a uh, um, the uh, a basis for arithmetic um, is going to be both complete and consistent. Any formal system of that scope is going to contain at, is going to give us at least one statement which cannot be proved from it. So you can't both be complete and be consistent, and that's a whole other video. But suffice it to say that that is not the kind of thing Husserl was interested in, which was just refine the axioms and then refine the axioms again, which is basically what Russell was doing with Peano and with um, non-Euclidean geometry. You kind of dispense with an unnecessary parallel line postulate which is the idea that any two lines which are not parallel will eventually intersect. And you're freed up from the unstated bias of drawing on a flat surface to non-Euclidean geometry allows you to kind of draw on a ball is one metaphor for it. And that's not what Husserl's interested in. Phenomenology um, is intrinsically different from the formal mathematical disciplines, and it can't borrow from them because it's not a formal math in the first place. Phenomenology is a material eidetic science, and the eidetic sciences, which are kind of these purified sciences, the way that geometry is a purified science, but, um, you know, so let me put it this way. You have either the uh, traffic cone on the side of a road in some road in Wyoming, or you have the geometrical um, definition of a purified Cone. In a certain sense, they're both cones, but the eidetic approach is this one, and the, I guess, empiricist approach is this one. So, eidetic science, um, and it's a material eidetic science similar to uh, geometry, but the analogy is that phenomenology gives you something like a geometry of experiences, and the methodology, therefore, must not proceed through obtaining symbolic results 
from a formal discipline, but rather from gaining, as I quote him, perfectly clear acts of apprehending the essence as it is given to intuition. So the difference in methodology between obtaining a symbolic result um, from you know the proper movement from axioms to you know uh, to deriving these results from the axioms. That's not what phenomenology is. Instead, it's about um, having a perfectly clear intuition of the essence rather than merely deriving it. And um, one uh, early look by Husserl, uh, the philosophy of arithmetic, might help us to understand this. So let me just make sure and see if there's any comments too. That's uh, important. Early luck by Husserl. Okay, so no comments. So uh, let's go ahead and so the philosophy of arithmetic by Husserl, early work, um, which is remarkably unread, but it was very, very, very good book. I'll do a whole video on that soon. Um, in which the relevance to our discussion right now is that in the ideas there's a preference for the wealth of an infinite number of essential phenomenological forms, as he says himself. It's a preference for that over some formal string of a symbolic result. And in the philosophy of arithmetic, you have a similar distinction between these acts of really, uh, which you have in something like three oranges. If you see three oranges, you have this act of grasping the number three, okay? And intuitively, <coughs> excuse me, you can do that for numbers about as large as 10. If you see about nine things, you can sort of intuitively grasp the number nine. But if you see 15,678 um, grains of rice in a heap, you won't be able to grasp that that's the number. Now, it's not to say that you can't have a relation at all intuitively um, or you know experientially to the number. It's rather that you'll have to think with a symbol. And the symbol that I've written here, 15,678, is precisely the symbol that gives you, as he would later call it, a significant intention of it. But there's other numbers where the problem is not just that it's too large to be grasped the way that you can grasp here that there's two giants helmets, there's three oranges. There's some numbers for which the problem is not that it's too large. It's that it's impossible to be grasped that way at all. And yet it's not impossible to derive symbolic results which are mathematically valid about it. So a number like the imaginary number I, is a number which cannot be notated more literally than i. So let me put it this way. Um, a number like one can be notated literally in the sense that the symbol one simply is the literal expression for the number one. Um, but the symbol i is not a literal expression of that number's value. It's more like a symbol which gestures to that. And for that reason, um, you can't maybe um, have this type of, you know, authentic uh, grasp of it. But you could still use um, these symbolic systems and symbolic operations to extend your knowledge about it to gain greater levels of certainty. So, for example, if you have this table of values of what happens with the exponentiation of i, i raised to the power of zero is one as you know, anything would be, um, i raised to the power of one is just i, it just evaluates to itself, but i squared is negative one. And the way that this is normally taught is that i is just the square root of negative one, which sounds like nonsense, except for the fact that if you raise that to the third power, you get negative i, because, you know, you're, well, you know what I'm trying to say, uh, because of ar arithmetically valid reasons. And then, of course, you raise that again and you go back to one. But if you look closely, you have this circulation of the same four values, and it moves backwards, too. So you can obtain these results, which are perfectly arithmetically valid and perfectly certain. And yet you're dealing with something grasped, you know, with intuition uh, in the same way like three oranges would. And yet you can still derive these symbolically valid results and use symbols to extend your knowledge. But of course, with phenomenology, 
you have this uniqueness with regard to the other um, eidetic sciences in that they largely work through obtaining results from foundations, um, whereas phenomenology is not that. It is more like grasping in single intuitions um, and using a methodology of description rather than a methodology of axiomatic foundations and results. So what this means is that Euclidean geometry, for example, first establishes some definitions, like you have a point as, you know, um, breathless, uh, depthless, widthless, sort of that which has no part. And you have a line, it's kind of, um, I don't know, giving you, uh, it's, it's one sense what you get is you have uh, a line drawn from a point to a point, and then you have surfaces which are kind of bound by lines. And um, then you have axioms like, um, or these foundational statements, like a straight line can be drawn from point to a point. Okay, so let's just say we have a point here, and we have a point here, and oh, what do you know, we can draw a line between them. And uh, all right angles are equal. So if we have a, a right angle um, in, you know, one right triangle and we have a right angle in another right triangle, we sort of already know that those are equal, okay? And circles described, um, given a center and a point, uh, or a center point and a determinate radius can sort of, that alone is enough to give you the circle. So if you know where the center is and you know how long the radius is, you can, you know, get the whole circle this way. So phenomenology differs from Euclidean geometry in that you don't establish axioms, and you don't establish these fundamental constructs like a surface, a point, an angle, and then build up more complicated results from them. Axiomatic sciences are limited by a finite number of concepts and propositions, but phenomenology is thought in this section to be something more like an infinite um, access to truths, which does not suffer from the finite limitations of Euclidean geometry. And phenomenology, therefore, differs from um, Euclidean geometry in that geometry can't really be grasped intuitively the way that a pure phenomenological essence can be. Geometry isn't really grasped. I'm talking about all of the conclusions of Euclid. Um, obviously, you sort of work them out, but you're constructing or building them up from the axioms and definitions. We, whereas, sorry, this mouse, uh, you know, on this laptop really sucks as far as like accidentally moving um, to the next slide. So geometry is constructed, it's built up, but phenomenology is grasped. And what's grasped, he talks about Erlebnis Wesen, Wesen, the term for essence, and Erlebnis, kind of, Erlebnis Wesen kind of given us experiential essences. And these are not built up or constructed. They're apprehended in a type of essential intuition. And rather than deriving them from symbolic operations, which we kind of like the letter I, we kind of have to, I guess, lend the power over to these operations themselves and kind of
Hello? So, looks like the internet crapped out again. And I don't even know where it stopped, but uh, I just for this moment and uh, try to resume. Actually, I'll just cut this and uh, finish the live stream uh, in the next video, all right?